Thanks for inviting me. And uh, this is a paper with Nezi and Cesar, both in the front row. Um, so the idea in the paper is we're trying to explain how family structure changed over, I don't know, since like 1960 roughly, so the last year or so years. And I'm just going to go through the stylized facts that we're uh, uh, um, trying to aim at here. So the first is there's like been a big decline in marriage, a big increase in divorce. And here we're going to emphasize the differences by education level. So you can see on this diagram here, this is showing like um, the stock or the number of people who have ever been married uh, by whether they have college, uh, less than college, that's the red line, or college, the black line. And you can see over this time period there's like been a pretty precipitous drop. And at the same time, you can see like there's been like a big rise in divorce for both less than college and college educated uh, people. The thing to note is, is like at 1960, less than college educated people were more likely to be married than college educated people. By the end of the period, it's roughly the same. And if you look at the divorce rate, uh, you know, they were slightly above um, college educated people in 1960, but at the end of the period, they were quite a lot more prone to getting divorced. Um, at the same time this happened, there's like been a rise in assortative mating. And so I'm going to show this in a couple of ways. Like the first is like contingency tables. So the way to look at this is like if you look at the cell down here in the bottom uh, right hand side, that shows the fraction of the population that say got a college educated degree of female married to a college educated male. The number in red, that shows what you'd have if you have random matching. And what you can see is when you compare the black and the red number, that uh, matching's not random. If you, uh, college people are much more likely to marry another college person than you would see uh, randomly. So this, say again what the red was? Uh -huh. The red is like what you'd have like if you had random matching. Okay. And the black is what you actually see in the U.S. economy. So the difference between the two is like a measure of the degree of assortative mating. And um, so like for instance, when you compare this cell with this cell, that's what you had in 1960, you can see that the number is much bigger. And if you look at the off-diagonal element, that would be a college-educated person with um, a non-college-educated -edu uh, non person. You can see that they become more negative or that uh, going from here to here is more negative, so you're less, uh, less likely to happen. If you just look at the correlation between um, uh, uh, education type across the male and the female, it rose from like 0.41 up to 0.52. I'm going to show you this like in another way now, which is maybe more obvious. So actually, which Flavio told me how to do. <laughs> so. Here, um, we're looking at the education of the wife, and we're guessing it on the education level of the husband. And because, like, obviously, the number of college-educated people has risen over this time period, we're putting in a dummy variable for each year from uh, 70 to 2005. And then I'm interacting it with this coefficient here, which is whether or not the um, husband uh, has a college degree or not. So I'm just going to, like, show you. This is how, how that coefficient beta changed over time. And you can see like uh, there's been an increase in assortative mating and it's got pretty tight confidence intervals around it. Uh, okay, and so like there's also been an increase in education female and labor force participation by females. So I'll start here by uh, this is the increase in labor force participation by females. So you can see both for college and non-college -edu educated females there's been like a big rise in uh, labor force participation over the time period. The panel that's inset, that's showing the contribution of a, the wife's income to the family income or household income. And you can see that that's like risen over this time period too. So that's a fact also that we would like to ex be able to explain. The last fact we're like after is like the increase in uh, college uh, um, education by females. So that's shown in the right panel there. And we're going to look at two forces here. One is, is that the, skill, the college premium actually rose. So that's uh, the black line on the left panel. 
and at the same time, the gender gap uh, narrowed. Okay, so that's the red line. So, you know, both of those could potentially account for the rise in female college attainment. So here's what we're going to do. So we're going to develop a model to understand these facts. Uh, first facts, uh, marriage and divorce. We want to, like, like potentially explain the pattern uh, by education. We want to also be, be able to potentially explain the rise in assortative mating. We also want to explain the rise in female labor supply and the rise in college uh, educational attainment actually by both males and females here. And the thing I want to just emphasize is like all of these are endogenous variables, okay, in our framework. Um, okay, and uh, so you'll see like in the next two sessions, um, uh, like uh, Victor and Raquel use similar models. So. Uh, what we're like missing, say that what Victor's going to look at is, there's no fertility decision here, which is an important thing. And so Victor's gonna look at um, the, you know, um, the rise in single motherhood, but in a model that's similar to what we have. And then uh, there's no savings here, which Raquel has in her model, and she looks at the riskiness of uh, how divorce, <coughs> riskiness, the increase in the riskiness of divorce affects people's savings and uh, labor supply decision, which we're not gonna focus here. <coughs> So what are the ingredients? So we're going to have two motives to get married. One is love, and the other is just going to be material benefits. And there's two material benefits in this model. One is like you can consume market goods, and the other is you consume non-market goods or home uh, goods. Um, and the driving forces, we're going to have two. And they're just going to be like technological progress in the home. So we're going to be able to say that you have labor uh, saving technological change in the home, and that allows females over this time period to enter the workforce. And then we're going to have technological progress in the market. And here that's defined as like the growth in overall wages, the increase in the skill premium. So like uh, going to college is paying, pay, uh, paying off more by the end of the period and a narrowing of the gender gap. So these are like the driving forces in the model. We're going to uh, estimate the model using minimum dis distance estimation. Um, the model fits the data pretty well. The thing that I like about it is, is like the key parameters that we uh, uh, estimate, they have very reasonable economic values. And uh, so I'll show you those uh, when, uh, you know, when we get there. Uh, and then after we've done this, we're going to like ask the question is how much of these changes were due to like technological progress in the household versus like technological progress in the market, which is defined as an increase in wages, an increase in this college premium, and an ink, a narrowing of the gender gap, okay? And so we're going to break it down. And what we find, like, is kind of surprising, and, you know, maybe it's, like, model-specific, but, like, I don't really know why it, sh it even holds, like, in our model, is, is that the model kind of decomposes, like, beautifully in the sense that technological progress in the home seems to be almost the sole or primary driver uh, in the rise of female labor force participation and really accounts for the predominance of the decline in marriage and the increase in divorce. On the other hand, wages, changes in wages, seem to account for almost all of the rise in education and uh, the increase in the sort of mating in the model or matching in the model. And um, uh, like I say, I don't know exactly why that happened, but that's how it broke down. So here's the model. There's going to be like... Uh, Males and females, you can be married or single, uh, you can be college educated or not, and everyone here is like infinitely lived and they die with probability delta, so we don't have to track age. Uh, agents are going to be born with an ability distribution, uh, born with an ability level, that's little a, they're going to draw this from a distribution, big A, um, we're going to assume like the, this is just like a normal distribution, and based on their ability level, they're going to decide whether or not to go to college, and here the cost of college is like a utility cost, just to make it simple. Uh, singles meet other singles randomly. When you meet another single, you kind of draw this match quality, which is love or bliss or whatever <coughs> you want to call it. And then based on that, plus some of the other attributes of the, your potential mates, such as their ability level, whether or not they went to college, uh, you can decide uh, whether or not to marry them. For a married couple, this match quality is going to be changing over time. And so if it goes down, maybe uh, one, of the, one party in the marriage wants to get divorced, and so they'll get divorced. If you get divorced, 
There's a one period delay before you can remarry someone else because you have to search for another person. And what we're going to do is there's going to be a utility bonus for matching someone of the same um, educational class. So what we're going to assume is like a college educated person maybe, uh, you know, likes to, uh, gets a higher utility level from marrying another college educated person. You know, vice, the same thing for if you went less than college educated. The thing I want to just emphasize here is that we do not allow that to change over time. Okay, so uh, that utility is actually fixed. Um, okay. I mean, in what sense does that explain the sort of dimension? That seems to sort of assume it. Well, that's, what I'm, that's why I emphasize that it's not changing over time. So you could think, yeah, maybe I could do that for 1960 or the other end, 2000, but then I have to, I, it's not going to allow me it's to explain the time change. Time. Sorry? It's taken over time if weight has changed. If the arguments change. Okay, weight has changed. No, 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 no. This is the utility function, Victor. There's only, whether your wife or your husband went to college matters. Yeah. And one place is richer than the other. The value of the of the money is smaller, but what is a higher So it's changing in some way. It's changing endogenously at this point. Yeah. It's changing endogenously and the, the, the no, force no, that no, you no, have I'm saying, I know, I'm just saying you, can, you get five units. Uh, the wage if the wage is one that corresponds to five units, so if all wages grow, now the wage is seven units. Yeah, I was just saying the actual so functional form so doesn't change the over is time. What you're saying is true, Victor. Well, it's also true for everything else in the utility function. If they're changing over time, one's changing relative to the other. Yeah, I think we know, know that, but okay. I'll show you. Even it, it's hard to like get yeah, to to match like to get like the degree of sort of mating in a some baseline year, like either sixty or two thousand, depending on how you you want it, or at least. It was hard for us to do, do it without this. Do you assume anything about when people match that you're more likely to maybe match? Is this similar to assuming you're more likely to draw somebody from an education type because they hang out in the same places? Or? That's what this is kind of, is this like a stand-in for? Uh, but there is an economic motive too. Like, you know, if you're a college educated person, maybe you, well, everyone would prefer to have a spouse that's richer. And so the people that are more likely to be able to get a spouse that is richer are obviously going to be someone that's college educated themselves or rich themselves. So, but that wasn't enough to, you know, get, get this thing uh, going, up and going. And so we had to add that you like someone that's similar to yourself in a sense. Well, in I think the way to answer Victor on this is to say, look, uh, let, let's take it seriously. Let's go back to 1850 when wages were really low. And we'll see that nobody married anybody outside of their uh, education group because the utility bonus was really large relative to the wage. And then as the wage grew over time, yeah. this utility bonus becomes yeah. less important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're starting at 60. Really not, but that would be the logic of the argument. Well, that wouldn't be good because we have more starting to Yeah. OK, so, um, okay. so to the model. Anyways, when I write down the function, you'll see exactly what I mean, I think. Uh, if it's not clear to uh, the rest of you. OK, so I'm going to have like one unit of time per person. And labor supply participation is going to be on the extensive margin. So you can either work or you don't work. And if you work, you're supplying the amount H bar. And what I'm going to assume here is like uh, singles always work. Um, and married males always work. So the only person that's really going to be making a labor force participation is, the, is a married female. Um, and there's going to be like a utility cost K associated with her going uh, to the workplace. And that's going to be a random variable. And like what we're thinking in mind here is that maybe some people have five kids. Maybe some people have two kids. Maybe for the person who has five kids or just kids, it's more expensive for them to go to work than someone that doesn't. And uh, 
So that's like a source of heterogeneity. And then the residual, because there's no leisure, that's one minus H. That's the amount of time you're spending in housework. Income. So your income is going to be made up of, I'm just going to multiply your ability level, that's A, times by the wage rate, whether you're educated or not. So um, um, uh, for a female, it's going to be exactly the same, except we're just going to have to multiply her wage too by the gender gap, which is going to be uh, phi here. And what we're allowing to change over time is, so I'm going to have like one, when E is one, that's college educated. And when E is zero, that's going to be like non, less than college educated. So the thing we're going to be allowing is like W1 to W0, that's the college premium, that will be increasing over time. And then also the gender gap will be narrowing over time, which actually corresponds to an increase in fee over time in this setting. The gender gap, it could be because of some form of learning by doing in the model. Yeah, it's not in our model, it's just exogenous, yeah. which is, yeah. So. I guess I'm a like little unhappy. We take the gender gap as like exogenous, and obviously, I think it is endogenous, a large chunk of it. We're just going to take it as an exogenous drive, of course. Singles. So, this is what a singles person's tastes look like. They're just spread over like market goods, non market goods. The things that are in red are the things like just to remember for how the model's like working. So this fractor C, that's that red C, that's like a fixed cost of establishing a household, okay? And so the idea here is like you'll see is that um, because it's fixed, there's economies of scale in the household, so you're better off if you're married than if you're single. So this provides an economic motive for marriage. The other thing is to look at is these elasticities. So N is like non-market goods versus the elasticity on market goods. Um, so I'm comparing here, um, uh, I guess this is, Xi versus Zeta. So to get the model up and running is what you need is you need the utility function for non-market goods to be more concave than the one for market goods. And what this does is um, it means like single households, they're the ones that don't have much time or because like a married household has two units of time versus one unit of time potentially for like a single household. They're going to be the people that benefit the most from labor-saving technological progress in this uh, economy because they're like starved uh, for non-market goods because they don't have much labor to supply at home. Okay, so what this is saying is that over time when you have labor-saving technological progress is that the single households benefit the most from this type of technological progress. So it, it, um, is now more beneficial to be single or more beneficial to get a divorce than it was like earlier on. So I'm not going to impose this restriction in the estimation, but it does turn out like, when we estimate the model that this is what you find, okay? And that's what the economics actually, you know, dictated like how it should work. Yeah. So put hours of work for single for flat. Yeah. So, but if, if they benefited a lot from from labor saving, I would have expected hours worth in the market to fall. Well, actually, we here I'm going to hold it fixed because it's on the extensive margin. But like Nezi and I have another paper which has a, is similar in a lot of ways where it was on the intensive margin, and you can predict the singles labor supply pretty well. So, but here, just to keep everything clear, I shut that down because this model has a lot of stuff in like education heterogeneity across, you know, um, you know, people with regard to um, their ability um, and stuff that the other model didn't, so we had to just like, like you know, um, economize and stuff, some stuff. This is what the utility function for a couple looks like. So the thing is, and, uh, is, is that here, what we're thinking about, this is total consumption in the household. And so what I'm dividing it through is... Yeah. Um, no, it's a good point, and uh, I think John actually has a paper that, or used to, I didn't read the, <laughs> the final version that like al allowed for that. Uh, 
Yeah, here's just like no kids, so I don't really have a good answer for you. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. There is like, it is true, like, you know, like on the one hand, like, uh, you can economize on like washing your kids' clothes. That's going to take a lot less time and, you know, stuff like that. On the other hand, if you've got to sink time into them and, uh, um, and if you're switching from quantity to quality, that those are going to go the other way, that you're going to be spending more time with your kids. But anyways, like we didn't do any of that in here. And so I can't really give you an answer like what would happen if we did. So. <laughs> um, Okay, so what I was going to say is you take total household consumption and then you're going to divide it through by a household equivalent scale and uh, to get like uh, consumption per person. And the idea here is, is that then, again, this is like another economy is of scale and forms a motive for getting married because it's uh, cheaper to, it does, you know, to feed two people costs less than, two married people cause, costs less than what it costs to feed two single people. Uh, you know, that's the idea here. This is a compatibility function, which uh, you know maybe we like or dislike. So the idea here is, if you got remember, if you're college educated, you will be a one. So then you're going to have a one one here, and so they're going to get a certain utility level. If you're non um, college educated, you will be a zero. So then you're going to get this utility so level mu zero mu here. Zero is smaller than mu one. Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. Mu zero is smaller than mu one. N yeah. No, but the thing to notice is, Victor, is that that is true. But also, I could have put the cross terms in here, and I've defined them to be zero. No, that's fine. Yeah. That's not what I was asking. No, okay. One of the biggest mysteries, I think, is that why do non-college people divorce more? Even if you think that the people who are not college people could afford a worse match. I mean, sorry, non-college people could afford a worse match. Uh, it might get a level, but I'm not so sure, sure, sure about the rate of change. You show, you show yeah. That they were, as we all know that the divorce rate is so much larger. Yes. Of non college educated people, and that's a very hard thing to get in any model like this. Because yes. comparing the, 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 the gain from, from, from money, Yes, I agree that quality. this would help me get the gap at the one end, so but not at the other end where it's the same. Yeah, at one end, yeah. I can well, explain well, one of the ends, 60 or 2,000. That that's exactly why this was, was there. Yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, yeah. Um, so like I said, we just actually discussed whether we wanted this or not in a long time because we were a little unsettled about it. Uh, so you can like it or dislike it, but uh, I think we need it. So um, match quality, uh, a married couple's going to get that. That's B. And then, like I said, again, there's going to be like a utility cost of the woman going to work, and that's going to be a random variable here, K, which is in red. So I'm thinking match quality for, for singles if they meet. They just draw it from a normal distribution. Couples, it evolves according to an AR1. That's uh, given by this. And then, like I said, like the, uh, the utility cost of a wife working is just comes from this two-point distribution. Okay, so here's like a key part of the model, and this is like how, uh, how you produce non-market goods, and this comes from Becker. And essentially, like, you use them two ways. You can do your time at home. That's this term here. Z stands for whether the household has two units of time or one unit of time, married or, or single. D is the amount of capital you're putting in or durable goods here, so like refrigerators, washing machines, Tupperware, you know, uh, you know whatever you use, the internet, um, cell phones, uh, you know, that can potentially save on time. And the key, like, driving force here is, is like, over time, we're going to allow the price of these goods to be, like, falling. So they're getting successively cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. And I'm going to estimate this price decline. And then I'm going to compare it with ex what, what you s see in the data. Uh, and you can tell me, you know, if you like that or not. Um, and so the key thing to get this working is I need, like, capital and time are going to be substitutes in the home, okay? And that corresponds to uh, lambda being in the range between 0 and 1, okay? And would you estimate that time that falls if you're including things like cell phones or you're just including 
No. So the, the, the reason I'm going to estimate it is is because I don't really know what the bundle of goods is. I mean, I'm going to come up with an answer, and that answer is going to be 8% a year. Oh, but you're going to use your model. To estimate, okay. yeah. But there is some evidence, like Robert Gordon has a book on the, on the price of durable goods. And so you could has a wide range, like TV sets, actually washing machines, refrigerators, dishwashers, uh, all that stuff is in there. And if you look at the household appliances, actually, they fall at roughly 8.9, I think. Even, so our, Over this yeah, our, our decline is actually less than what he estimates. But, you know, he doesn't have stuff like, because his book's a bit dated, like cell phone, Tupperware, Pampers. I mean, there could be a lot of stuff like uh, you think can save time, you know, besides the eight or nine goods that he, so, you know, um, gives us the estimate for. Jeremy, why do people always talk about household appliances, like not including cars? Why are cars not part of this labor saving? Um, they could be, right? That's what I like. So that's what I'm saying. I'm estimating the price here. I'm not really saying what these goods You're should be. Yeah, I'm not. I don't want to take a stand. Be, and and actually, in, in Gordon's book, the price of cars is in there, and it probably fell. I think you know roughly in that range too. I mean, because uh, um, there's been like a big uh, improvement in cars. Just for instance, like he he notes this, <laughs> just how much longer they last. Their life is double. Uh, and so, like when you do a quality adjustment, that leads to a huge decline in the price of cars over time. So, yeah, I think it's really easy that though, because people live that much further out, also, um, and, and places they can go shopping. So you know, you have to yeah. So and um, Jeremy, yeah. Do you think this is a price relative to other consumption goods, or just just the price decline? Um, I, actually, here I. Th uh, yeah, here we measure it relative to the price of other consumption goods, yeah, and uh, non-durable consumption goods in particular. I guess the question, uh, how, how do you measure D? I don't. So, <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, yeah. There, there are two types of technical problems. You want to count in the same thing twice. Okay. I have, when, when you measure documented weight of the product over time, yeah. you're also saying that's measured in the goods whose productivity doesn't grow. But where there's a measure over a bundle of goods, as you say, in addition to the increase in wages over time, there is a secondary thing. So that's like things are growing, they're counting twice. Uh, I don't think so. So I'm looking at wages relative wages to the price of non-durable goods. goods. All, the thi all these things are consumption goods, and the way wages are measured includes productivity growth in all these goods. Well, yeah, uh, not in the model. It's not, but you know, I think he's talking about the national income accounts. So, so. value is the whole. Is relative to the whole bundle of goods. No, here wages are relative to non-durable goods, so and same, and P is relative to non-durable goods too. So I'm looking at time relative to non-durable goods, durable goods relative to non-durable goods. So there's two relative again, prices. I'm saying something simple. I'm saying the nine percent. Yeah, so on this, yeah, I know what you're saying. So there's another way you can do it, which I actually did in the paper, which is, is what Victor is suggesting. You could measure all prices in terms of units of time. Then it's going to be, instead of like 8%, you're going to get like a 10% decline, roughly. Okay, But that's immaterial. It's not going to change anything. That's like a, like a, a tertiary detail. Okay, But you can look at like, like with my paper with Anansha Shadri and Mehmet Yar Koglu in Ari Stud, and that's exactly how we measure everything in units of time. But it's not like a, it's, you know, I don't think it changes anything. Okay. So just the main mechanism, prices of durables, plunging. So you're going to substitute towards durables and away from using labor who's getting more expensive over time. Okay. And, and, uh, and Victor's saying it's more ex even more expensive than I th I'm saying because wages are rising at the same time, too. And I agree with that. <laughs> okay.
Here's a static consumption decision for singles. Uh, this is like if you're a male, the wage is times your ability level, times how much you work. And here I'm just subtracting off the price you're paying for uh, uh, the durable goods. If you're a female, it's exactly the same, but I've got to multiply it by the gender gap. And this is subject to your household production function. Uh, um, okay, and the thing I just want you to know is that gives you like a, utility, a momentary utility function. So the gender gap is, uh, is a parameter. It's not related at all to preferences. Or yeah, no, it's, I'm just going to try to take it from the data. And it is like a... Uh, uh, um, um, it's a parameter. Yeah, I was going to say there are issues with m measuring it, which is what I was going to mm -hmm. say. Like maybe it's narrower over time, but you know maybe. Uh, um, well, I'll get to that when I get there. Okay, so here's the the same de the decision problem for the married household. The things in red are what's like different. So for a married household, I got to take off the cost, the utility cost of the lady going to work. And then in the budget constraint, now I have two sources of income. So I've got to add the female's income in as well. And so that's what the second term is. And then if I go to the household production function, now I've got two units of time. So I subtract off the, what the male's putting in the market. Then I subtract off what the female's putting into the market, which is an endogenous variable. So that's how this goes. So uh, here's like a, a timing diagram. So I'm thinking singles. So I'm going to take your male. You're, you're type A, you have like an education level E. What you're going to do is you're going to go to the marriage market. You're going to draw like a potential mate. She's going to be like maybe type A star and some associated education level. And uh, so you're going to draw a bliss level and you're going to uh, also draw what's the cost of that woman going to work. And then the couple are going to decide whether they're going to marry and, uh, or not. And uh, after that, depending on whether they're single or married, they make their household allocations. Couple. Now we have A, he's married to a female A star. Their B is going to evolve over time. They have to decide whether they want to remain married. So that's a divorce decision. And if they stay together, then they uh, decide on their joint consumption allocations. If they divorce, they are treated like singles. And at the beginning of the time, each people draw their A's. And then they are going to decide in this framework whether to get educated or not based on their ability. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you, Victor, that's a good point. I actually forgot to say something. Um, all the utility within a married couple is public. So they, they, they share like jointly and equally in all utility. So there's nothing to bargain over. Yeah, and, and uh, yes, I should have said that. <laughs> Sorry? They may not agree on whether it's worth to be married or not. So they both agree to be married. Yes, that's going to be on the next slide, exactly. Okay, so now actually two slides down the road. Okay, so this is like a single um, person's problem. So this is like his dynamic programming problem. So he's currently single. That's his utility from being single. What's going to happen is he goes to the marriage market. He's going to like draw a female, say that's A star. She has an education level E star. They draw a bliss B and uh, uh, a cost of her going to work. This indicator function, which I've got to explain two slides down the road, that's what Victor was asking about. That's going to give a value 1 if they choose to be married. Then you get B here. And it'll give a value 0 if they choose not to be married. Then you're going to get VS. That's the value of being single, lifetime utility from being single. And I'm just like integrating this over uh, the types of females you can draw from. The, from the bliss distribution and from the cost of work distribution. And the thing I just want to emphasize here, which is why it's in red, the distribution over singles that's available on the marriage market is, of course, like an endogenous variable. So I have to solve for that. Okay. Couples. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, you want me to go back? Yeah. No, just, uh, if you don't have any frictions, because marriage is a public good, you're really going to get all sorts of different actions. So the only reason Model is going to give you positive matching right away with this public goods. 
Yeah, the frictionless model has a problem, right? It has the reverse problem. You're right. Uh, that you're going to get perfect assortative match. Right, right. So you're so, thinking like so, doing so a Gale Shapley algorithm? Yeah, so that's so, like. So, so the, the random matching gives you too much non assortative matching, so you're trying to get back some positive assortative matching. Yeah, it's not exactly a friction, value. right? Because I could get rid of the search friction, and then I could have this like uh, uh, just a random variable, which I'm calling bliss. And so yes. say that's unobserved from the econometrician, then I would see something less than a positive. Perfect, yes, yeah. Yes. And uh, I guess this is like. Uh, you know, Pierre Andre, like maybe in his case, B would be whether you smoke oh, or not no, or something. Uh, and no, so you always meet somebody, so there's no uh, meeting, right? You always meet someone and then you, you accept or, yeah, sorry, accept or reject. But the person you meet might not be yes. the ad ideal yes, type. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, besides bliss, maybe they don't, they're not college educated or, you know, whatever. Um, Okay, so here's the couples value function. It's essentially the same thing, except now we have bliss and we have the compatibility thing that I added in for like if you're you actually. Couples don't have bliss, so I don't know what you mean. I think you do know what I, what, uh, what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at each of their utilities. Okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, Okay, so, um, yeah, actually, the notation's not so good here. So what you have to do, so this is like going to be like the utility from. Uh, but then, then I think so work. This is the value for a male of being married. Yes, yes, yes no, exactly. No, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, no, I, what I was going to say is, yeah, what I wanted to say, and that's why I knew what you mean. Like, okay, but for everyone else's, if I wanted to know what the one for the female is, then I have to just permute the subscripts. I switch the positions of A star with E star, and, and that gives you the one for a female, okay? Maybe so. Be the <laughs> yeah, no, he, <laughs> he meant like whatever gender the first two arguments is, that's his, I, then I knew he knew. Uh, um. Okay, and so the only issue for like a married person is, is like their B prime is going to evolve over time, and so they have to make a decision that this indicator function here, like if it gives back a value one, then they remain uh, married, and if it gives back a value zero, they're going to choose to go back and be on the singles market, and then they're going to get VS. Okay, so coming back to it, this, I think Victor mentioned it. So the whole question is how do I determine these indicator functions? And the indicator function is going to be 1. If for both people, the value of being married exceeds the value of being single. So note that I permuted them exactly like uh, what Victor said. And if it's one of them is 0, then there's no marriage. Yeah. Just, yeah, just a clarification question. The, the only decision they make is whether she works or not, right? Um, the, you can reduce it to that. There is like, like how many durable goods you want to buy, too. And then, like that, those two things together would imply how much uh, consumption of non-durables they have. Yeah, I think I cut off. The, like you're, you're right in principle. Like in a general model, that's true because. Say I had each of them value their own leisure separately, uh, even, then that would be true. Even if there is no leisure, they, you know, it's my utility depends on marketable goods. So is it crucial that you assume that you have exactly the same utility and the modulus of substitution to marketable and non-marketable good is the same for us? And yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, actually, Nezzy and I have another paper where if you make it slightly different, say you had kids. Kids is the natural thing to, to I don't know, Victor. You know, it's going to talk about this. Uh, so if you have kids, like in, then it's the case like if you get divorced and if maybe the kids stick with the female, right away there's going to be disagreement. And so what Nezzy and I did was they had dynamic Nash bargaining to resolve that. <coughs> but here, by construction, we dumped all of those problems <laughs> exactly by assumption. And so, um, uh, uh, Again, it was just for simplicity. I'm not saying it's like good, uh, you know. Um, uh, okay, education. That's done uh, at uh, you know the time when a young single 
grows up, uh, becomes a, a young adult, I should say. And then, uh, so he's just going to p pick E to maximize his expected lifetime utility subject to the cost. Okay, so I'll just go over this briefly. And yeah, and this is the last uh, uh, piece of the theory. So I have to figure out how you get this endogenous distribution for signals. And what there is is like there's going to be a flow into the, say this is the distribution for singles next period, but we're going to look like a fixed point. So there's going to be like a flow into singles from two sources. First, there'll be singles that were actually single in the previous period, but they got bad matches and decided to remain single. Okay, so this is like just if you look here, this is person A, E, he meets Miss A star, E star. For whatever reason, they decide that they don't want to get married, so I is equal to zero, and then I got to count the number of these people, and some of them are going to die in this, m this model at rate delta. Then I'm going to have the couples, right? Some of them are going to just like, their B is going to evolve to a bad B, and so they're going to have, decide, set their I equal to zero, one of them, and so then they're going to become divorced, and so we're going to have a flow into singles from the divorce market, and then I got to replace all the dead people, okay? And then I'm looking like at a fixed point to this. And that determines how many singles of each type for male and female there are going to be on the marriage market. Okay, and I can do the same thing for, to get the distribution for married people. Okay, and, and uh, uh, actually, besides the estimation, this is like the, the slow point in the program. Okay, it's like computing this. So maybe doing directed search like John does, which avoids all of this, is good. Um, okay, so. Here, I'm, we're going like, to focus on the estimation. I'm just going to have two steady states, 60 and 2005. The model period will be a year, lifespan 30. Uh, probability of survival um, is 97%. That's from the data. For Glenn, uh, the discount factor is 0.96, or the real interest rate's 4%. Um, uh, work time, if you actually work, we're just going to say it's 36% of uh, your time spent working if you choose to work. Household production, we're just going to take the estimate from McGratton, Rogerson, and Wright, uh, which they find as substitutes. Actually, this is a conservative estimate. A better one for us to use would be the one by Chang and Shorefide. These are the two that I know about, which actually has a, a lambda that's closer to one. They, both, both estimates are supposed to take us as lunacy. They're all designed to have future lessons. Yeah, that's a good point, but I was going to say, to put it another way, like Victor saying it's not appropriate, but the reason I think maybe it's not appropriate is that they're basically come from time series or business cycle models, and, and I, I don't know if that's what you're saying indirectly, Victor, but, um, but anyways, it's not like there's a, like a, uh, a book where I can draw a bunch of these things from, and Victor's saying, well, you could do it yourself, uh, and I, yeah. Well, you could estimate it with yeah, yeah, I could act, I, we could do that. So I just saying, okay, so here's like a bit of an issue. So if you look at like the college premium in 19, uh, 1960, it was like 34%. So obviously like the college premium, I have efficiency wages here, so I can't set the ratio of efficiency wages for, for, skilled, and un, uh, for skilled and unskilled people to be this because this number here is going to be like the efficiency wage times by the average ability for college men times by the average ability for non-college men. These are like endogenous variables in the model. So I'm going to take a shortcut which only works if my cal estimation is successful. I'm going to shove in the actual number of people that went to college into the numerator and the denominator. And then I'm going to hope that my estimation procedure delivers some number back that's close to that. And if it did, then it's going to say that this number for the growth and efficiency wages should be 7%, okay? And it is. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing for the increase in non-college educated wages over time and uh, the college premium in 2005. Jeremy, did, did you say that again? I didn't, make it, I didn't understand it. Yeah, I, I didn't probably explain it really well. So what I'm saying is like in the model, I'm looking at the efficiency unit per unit of ability. So the ability is good both for education, helps you, you make it easier to take education, and it's also useful in the labor market later, is that it? No, the idea is like, obviously like the people that went to college are the higher ability people, 
on average, and here they are for sure, right? And so part of this 1.34, the, be the benefit of going to college, actually in the model, and plus in the real world, is due to the fact that those people are more just, it's not like the fact they went to college, they're just better people, you know, like uh, um, have, are more productive. Okay, so, um, so I if you believe that, then the number I should be getting is not like for the growth and efficiency wage, it shouldn't be 34%, it's got to be something smaller than that because the people with the higher ability are the ones that are moving into being college educated. So what I'm going to do for that is I'm just going to take a shortcut. I'm going to assume that I have the model cor correctly predicts how many people, what the threshold is, who goes to college in 1960 and who doesn't go to college. And I'm going to plug that in and that allows me to get this average ability from the model right out. If I did that, then that would say that the increase in efficiency wages should be 1.7%. It's like a smaller number, okay? And, uh, um, and then I have to come back later on and show you that actually the model did do that. I could hit that target, so this was shortcut was legitimate to do. I, uh. I guess my question was, why would the, if I understood it, why would the ratio of the numbers match the ratio of the ability, the average ability? What, why it doesn't match the ratio of the average ability. You're just saying the number yeah. lets you figure out the ratio. Yeah, the yeah, exactly. The yeah. yeah. Okay, so just to be clear, I have, as a function of the parameters, the model gives a set of predictions. I have a bunch of data objects. I'm just going to minimize the squared, uh, the, uh, the, square, the difference of the squares. And then I can compute the standard errors using this formula here. And, uh, Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to flash over this slide. These are all the things I'm estimating. I'm only going to focus on a subset of these parameters. That's why I'm going to go, and this is like the subset, okay? But it's a lot of parameters, standard error, confidence interval. I'm going to focus on these ones that have an economic interpretation. So the, uh, and I, gotta, I have three minutes left. So what I'm going to say is like alpha, that's the weight you put on market goods. That roughly corresponds, so I have market and non-market goods. That number that I estimate here, would roughly be the same thing as putting a third on consumption and, and two-thirds on leisure, in a, which is a standard number in macro. If I move down here, non, the, the elasticity on non-market goods consumption is three. For uh, market good consumption, that's two. The two is a very standard number to use for the coefficient of relative risk aversion in a macro model. C, the fixed cost for household formation, that's about 15% of your consumption is, goes to the fixed cost of a household. So I don't know if that's reasonable or unreasonable. That's what it is. Let me say prices, they're actually falling. I, I said 8, but they fall at 7.4% a year. Gordon's book roughly says they sh should be like about 8 or 9% a year, okay? So these are like the key. That's all the moments that I'm matching. So I'm just going to like now tell you. Uh, I got two minutes left. I'm going to go through. So these are like the full set of moments, and I'm going to like break them down into smaller categories so we can understand. This is education. So the red's the model, the black's the data. 60 to 2005, a big increase in education for males and females, slightly more for females than for males. The model gets that, okay? Um, marriage and divorce. So if you look here, 1960, this is the number of married people. 2005, it declined to 0.652. As you can see, the model gets the big decline in marriage and the big rise in the number of people that are single. Marriage doesn't include cohabitation. No, not here it doesn't. But actually, in the other paper at Nessie, we added in cohabitation. And it's like a very small actual difference on the... On, uh, at least for the U.S., like in, in other countries, that's not so true. Um, and is this driven by whites or blacks? Or? I, I didn't understand. Uh, Did, do, you have, do you have race in the... So Did we look at all people? Everybody. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, this is all people. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't, I had to ask. Because I think there's been a very big decline. Yeah, yeah, we have no, uh, uh, yeah, we have no theory of why that would be at this point. So the thing to note here, like to focus on these red hours. So this is saying like this is the drop in the, in the married for less than college educated and 
college educated people, so it's much bigger for less than college educated people. And the model has a big drop. It's slightly bigger for less than college educated people. But uh, if you look at the rise in the divorce rate, it's much bigger for less than college educated people. And actually, the model does very well on that. Like the divorce rate is, the jump in the divorce rate is much bigger for less than college educated people. And actually, when I'm looking at a sort of mating, that's the thing at the end here. There's a, like an increase in that. And the model has an increase that's like way too big, okay, from 0.1 to 0.5. So it has no problem uh, generating uh, a decline in a sort of mating. Um, okay, so should I go to conclusions? Yeah, I think I'm out, right? Because I I'd exactly had time to, to think. Um, okay, so I wasn't being able to show you uh, uh, the breakdown, so, but the conclusions will do it. So we constructed an equilibrium model that gives a decline in marriage, an increase in assortative mating, and an increase in uh, uh, education and, and female labor force participation. If I'd actually be able to show you and decompose the results, what we found was that technological progress in the household led to the increase in female labor force participation and the decline in marriage and the rise in divorce. And that the changes in wages like accounted for largely the increase in education and the rise in the sort of mating. And uh, that is it. So thank you. Mm -hmm.